I, th I think and hope all of you have been following what's going on. Uh, this protest issue that has dominated our semester continues in full force with meetings today and yesterday uh, between owners and players, not just the union involved in this. Actual players are going to NFL owners meetings. I've been to NFL owners meetings for 15 years. I've never seen a player attend. Uh, and all of a sudden, we have 11 players. Um, no, actually, 11 owners. I think it was like 13 players, including Malcolm Jenkins and Howie Long, or Chris Long. Uh, so all these, all these new things are happening in the sports world that never happened before. It's this convergence of sports and politics, this convergence of sports and protest. We're going to talk about it in here today. We're obviously going to talk about it tomorrow in this uh, pop-up lecture that Dean Alexander wants me to supervise tomorrow or talk about. Uh, so obviously it's in the news, it's something we'll talk about, and I know Sarah has assigned a group to sort of take each side of the issue, pick it apart, and we'll leave it at that <laughs> for the rest of the semester unless something crazy happens again. Um, we will also get to our baseball collusion case because obviously collusion is now in the news again with the same guy, Colin Kaepernick, has brought a collusion suit. So we'll take a background look at collusion basically in baseball before analyzing what the case could be in football with Colin Kaepernick. Um, and we will get to all of that and go through it. We have a surprise visitor though. Was anyone at the DiCarlo uh, Symposium at noon today? Okay, in some ways that's good because I have cherry picked what I think, nothing against the rest of them, was the best speaker. Uh, from the symposium and have asked her to jump in here before her flight leaves today. So award-winning uh, sports, not sports, award-winning journalist uh, Ginger Casey is here. I'm going to have her come up and we're going to talk about her background in news and also her sort of views on working in sports tangentially through the years. So welcome Ginger Casey. Thanks so much. Oh, you're so welcome. I wish uh, you guys could have heard her today, but now you can hear her for a brief uh, kind of uh, short version of it. And I'd, I'd just sort of like, if you would, go quickly through your background. And then if you want to jump right into thoughts on what's happening in the world, we've seen it from the sports angle, but how the president controls the media, what media has become with partisan politics some of the thoughts you've already shared today. Well, thank you, Professor. <coughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ginger Casey, and I worked in television news for 25 years. And over that time, I worked uh, coast to coast, different networks, ABC, CBS, NBC, PBS. And as I uh, progressed in my career, I began to realize, as a woman, there were uh, certain deficiencies in, in how uh, women were being treated. Um, but I think during that time, we were also working to overcome all of that. We worked very, very hard to be taken as equals and fought hard to be called co-anchors uh, as opposed to the sub-anchor status that we had all been given when we started in the business. And things come full circle in an odd way. Uh, when I was first trying to get into the business, I thought, oh, it's, I'm never going to get in because they're only hiring beauty contestants off the ramp and giving them jobs sitting next to the credible looking older uh, gray haired anchor man. So we used to call the formula the uh, anchor man and his homecoming queen daughter. Uh, and so we, as I said, we pushed back, we fought, we eventually got uh, hired for our journalistic skills. And then we began to be called co-anchors. We expect to be good journalists. and. There were a couple of years where everything was wonderful in the industry for women. And um, they were working very hard to bring us, bring us in as uh, participants in the process. I, what I see now, though, is a kind of rollback uh, on a lot of the standards that I was raised with. And I think there are many reasons for that. There is the monetization of the news issue, the competition from uh, Facebook and uh, all these other sites that are now called news sites and the rollback hasn't just occurred in terms of uh, money 
people getting into TV news today make less than they were making 30 years ago. Hmm. Just so you know if you, anybody here wants to get into television. And what they've done to women as well is uh, now they're being told by consultants they have to wear uh, super skin tight dresses. Uh, you see it, you turn on television, you see what the women are dressing like. And, um, and the men are still wearing their suits and ties and looking like they're there to do business. And, the women look like they're there to serve cocktails. And so um, I'm very concerned about that as a woman because I think what's going to happen to those women is that when they begin to age like real women and can no longer fit into those dresses, they're going to be replaced. And coming at a time especially when they're capable of doing their greatest work. So that's an issue that's close to my heart as someone who was on the air for a very long time. I think also the quality of the journalism is very suspect now. We have a president who calls uh, journalists enemies of the people. He calls us scum, disgusting. Um, he tweets about us. He, he has created this meme called fake news, which um, essentially means news you disagree with. <laughs> and there's a very real difference. So um, I'll just tell you quickly how I define it. Mm -hmm. I think fake news is news that is completely fabricated like the National Enquirer, you know, the supermarket tabloid that has all those funny headlines, like, I was Bigfoot's love slave, or, you know, <laughs> Obama appoints Martian for ambassador. And it, everybody's in on the joke, kind of. We all know it's silly kind of stuff. But um, that's fake. What's also fake is when a news organization, one of these so-called news organizations, run with, runs with a story that Hillary Clinton is running a, <laughs> child sex ring out of the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. Do you guys remember that story? They called it Pizzagate. And everybody thought it was very funny, especially since the building didn't even have a basement. But <laughs> what wasn't so funny was when the guy showed up with a gun and shot off the front door, saying he believed it and he was there to liberate the kids. And of course, they took him away. But the, to this day, that pizza parlor owner has to still pay for 24-hour security for himself and his family because he continues to get death threats from people who believe that story was true. That's very, very dangerous, and that's fake. Bias news is news that has a particular political point of view. People could say Fox News, for example. Um, they say they're fair and balanced. In my opinion, they're neither. But uh, <laughs> they take a very conservative take on uh, the day's news, and they're not ashamed to admit it. MSNBC is also, you can say, on the other side of that spectrum. It's very uh, left-leaning. Um, but they make, uh, they make no apologies, and they tell you who they are and kind of where they're coming from. So that's biased news. Wrong news is when a story is just wrong, then they have to correct it. And that's not being fake. That means you made a mistake. And it really happens so seldom, in my opinion, that, that when it does happen, they make movies about it. Movies called, like, did you see Shattered Glass? It was about uh, a reporter for the New Republic who they found out was just making up his stories. Mm. He was dead lines. He was making up everything. And so here, here he was doing fake news. But the uh, publication issued an apology, as you'll see quite often from the Post or the New York Times. They issue corrections. They tell you where their processes broke down. They tell you what corrective action they're taking to uh, ensure that this doesn't happen again. So that's the three different kinds of news that I think are, kind of are in play right now. The so-called fake news, um, which to our administration is news that uh, they disagree with, uh, biased news, and then uh, when news is incorrect. So that's something to consider when you are reading or watching or surfing different little news organizations. How has social media ch changed the game? Because we talk about the fight to be first, the fight to get it out rather than maybe get it right. Well, I think you, you should realize that a reporter today, from the moment they get that assignment handed to them, they have to start producing content immediately across multiple platforms. Uh, on their way to their story, they have to tweet about it. They have to um, shoot some video with their cell phones and get it back to the news organization. They have to blog a little bit about what they're uh, writing about. They, and each one of those platforms requires a different kind of journalism. 
Then they're required to go out, and now, um, because of budget cuts, they have to shoot their own story while they set it mm. up, and they're shooting their own story. Um, then they use their computer to edit it in the field and send it back. And then they have this little case that they carry around. It's about, about this big, and it sets up live shots. So they are writing their stories, producing their stories, editing their stories, and even doing the live shots now. And what's missing, and what ends up missing quite often, is the kind of uh, in-depth look and analysis of an event that helps them provide context on the story. They're just constantly streaming content now. And some news organizations are actually telling reporters that it is more important to be first than it is to be right. Uh, and they say, just go with what you got, and we'll update it as the day goes on. And they, they say this because they think people like you expect to have the information now. You don't want to wait until 6 o'clock. You don't want to wait until tomorrow morning. You want to know what's going on now. But what often occurs is the first narrative is quite often incorrect. Um, if you guys followed the Las Vegas shootings, I mean, the conspiracy theories began rolling out before the last bullet got fired. And because I think into the vacuum, now that they're pressured, they have to provide something. Into this vacuum, they just fill it with speculation. Hmm. And then later, when they find out the facts of the story, people are like, no, 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 that's not what happened. I, I heard what happened. And then they'll tell you what the first narrative was. So when you're reading the news or watching the news or consuming the news, it's important to kind of keep all this in mind. And I always just recommend that people read very widely. They, they read different sources. Um, how many of you guys read a newspaper today? I see a show of hands. <laughs> oh, yeah. Three. OK, three people. Well, how many people got your news from Facebook today? How many people watched a newscast today? All right, so where are you getting your news? Can I ask anybody here? Different websites, probably. Yeah, it's a Twitter. You get your news from Twitter. OK, anybody else? Anything else? I get mine from like the skin, like a, the skin? an email. Yeah, a daily email. The skin? Yeah. Yeah, OK. So the skin and Twitter. I mean, these are not traditional news organizations. And Twitter is usually just stories from people that you follow, journalists you follow. Yeah, like the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. Like OK. So you'll, you'll follow it that way. Incredible, hopefully. OK, so what is that telling you? The traditional media is kind of gone. You, you are looking for breaking news as it happens, and you go straight to the internet for it. Breitbart News. How many here have ever listened to Breitbart News? You know who I'm talking about? OK. Breitbart's managing uh, editor just recently told the college class, there is no such thing as journalistic integrity anymore. There is only the weaponization of information. Think about that. Where is the goal of you know, honest, straightforward reporting and all of that? There is, it's not there. They are there to give you stories that are designed to create uh, change in the culture. And so the, the um, what would you call it, the mission of trying to inform the public with good, good solid facts and good solid reporting, that's not, a, that's not a news organization. That is a political organization that's massaging you. It's massaging uh, the viewers and the readers. And that's something to consider in your Facebook feed. You know, the news feed that comes up on the side? Um, it'll be different for me than it is for you, than it is for you, because based on what you've been liking, they start feeding you news. And, and the danger in that is it's creating kind of an echo chamber. So what you're reading all the time is news that you agree with, as opposed to any kind of journalistic discovery. So as we came out of our speech an hour ago, our panel an hour ago, was how important it is, even if you love democracy now, even if you love NPR, that you still look at other sites that will challenge what you believe in. Because more and more, news is getting fed to you and massaged to you online, specifically to tailor who you are as a product. For example, Facebook. If something that, that that big is free, well, what do you think the product is? The product is you. Every time you like something, every time you post a little comment, they are studying you, and they're using your data. They're mining your data, 
and then suddenly very specific ads start showing up for you based on what they think you like. And, and, and then they bundle you up and they sell you the third parties who are looking for the demographic of the, of the college students, of the law school. They can say even the people who are taking your course. They can parse it down that tightly. Hmm. So something people need to be aware of today when they're, when they're consuming news is quite often the news is also consuming them. Have we crossed the Rubicon on that? I mean, is there any way to get it back? Get back the integrity that you're talking about that we've lost? I think it's kind of up to the audience to uh, insist on integrity and to argue for it. I think many news organizations are under so much financial pressure now because of the competition coming from so many different places that the, the mission is being replaced by the financial people's, you know, the, the squeeze to make money from, from the product, as they call it, the product. So I think it's very important that if you, if you read a story or locally if you watch a story and you think it was wrong or off or insensitive, you call. You call and you say something. In order to have a television license, a television station has to keep a file. And in that file is every letter, or in this case today, an email that they get from the outside public. And when it comes time to review their license, um, they have to provide all of that public feedback that they've gotten to see whether or not they are actually honoring the public trust of having those airwaves. Uh, where it gets a little um, dangerous for me is when you have a president who is threatening, say, NBC. He's tweeting about how maybe we should talk about pulling their license. Um, well, first of all, you can't pull a network license. You can only pull a station license. And so people say, well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but there's always the uh, problem of him stimulating his base and getting them to write 10,000 letters to the station that go into the file. Right. And so that when it does come time in a couple of years to look at the file, hey, we got 10,000 letters here saying that you're not, um, you're not doing anything in the public interest. So that's another kind of thing that's going on right now as they argue over where the, where the licenses of the station should be. Just quickly on what you've mentioned on the, the treatment of women on air and I, I've seen it at ESPN as well. Where do you think that changed? You said there was progress, 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 and now it looks like we're going backwards. What, what has caused that? Well, again, trying to monetize the news, and I call it the eye candy factor. You know, how do you get eyeballs on the screen? You know, and somewhere along the line, uh, a cons you know, a, a network executive, well, actually, I can tell you where it started. It was Roger Ailes. Do you know who he is? Fox News, he was the chairman. And he was starting to make all these women dress like dominatrixes on the news. And they tight, tight, tight dresses and tight, tight, tight suits. And he was in the news a year or so ago when uh, it kind of all blew up on him the way it's blowing, it's blowing up right now in Harvey Weinstein. And all these women came out and said, well, not only was he forcing us to model our clothes for him, he was, he was a horrible sexual predator. And these women all kept their mouths shut because they knew they would be fired. Who are you going to report sexual harassment to if the chairman of the company is the one doing it, right? So uh, it went on for a very long time. And the model was you know, successful. It was a successful model. People began watching the, you know, the babes, you know, the news babes. And uh, it became popular. And then little local stations started picking it up. And, and now, if you watch local news, you'll see these, these women are like struggling to get into these super tight, you know, skin tight dresses and get their hair all up big and they all wear fake eyelashes now. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. If anybody had ever told us to dress that way, we'd have laughed them out of, out of the newsroom. But now, they flatter these women and they say, well, you know, you're not just talented, you're beautiful, so why would you hide that? And they kind of all go along with it. You know, I say complicit in their own oppression uh, in that sense. Uh, the sports world, because um, I know you guys are all talking about sports here. The sports world is probably, um, the stories about ESPN, I know you work for ESPN, but you know, the stories are legendary about, it's a it's giant locker room. And so you can imagine, you know, the kind of jokes and the kind of kidding around that goes on there uh, in a locker room. Uh, the problem is there are a lot of women in the locker room now too. 
when I remember when women were first getting into uh, the locker rooms after a game, and they were suing to get into the locker room. Right. And it was because that's where the interviews were. And so these women were saying, well, look, I'm a sports reporter. I should have the same access to the players that everybody else has. And rather than say to them, OK, well, look, after you're all showered and dressed, come out and we'll do a news conference. You know, the guys were holding news. They were having news conferences in the locker room standing there naked. Um, and so for women to sue to have access to these interviews, they began allowing them into the locker room. Uh, and quite often, men would be naked, walking around. And uh, the story I was just telling him at lunch was about Reggie Jackson. And he was known. He didn't like it. He didn't like it that they were letting women in. And uh, there was a woman that I worked with who was a sound engineer. And it used to be they'd break up the equipment. There was a cameraman who ca carried the camera. And then there was a sound engineer who carried what they called the deck, which they would control the sound and the microphones with. So Reggie, there was a woman who was a sound engineer I worked with. And he would come out to do the uh, interview. And he'd walk right up to her, buck naked. He'd walk right up to her face and just sort of stand there and start talking to everybody, knowing she was kneeling with the microphone up for, for the interview for the reporter. Um, and everybody just talked about, oh, isn't that awful? But nobody ever called him out and said anything to him about it. And the woman just looked down at the ground and, and did the interview. You know, hopefully that's all changed now. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Come on, you watch TV. <laughs> I'll ask you a question. Oh, no, go ahead. Sorry, I do have a question. Like, in that scenario, whose responsibility do you think it is to kind of remedy that situation, right? Because I feel like the locker room is kind of, it's been like that for forever. Of course, it's I don't know if it's going to change because it seems to be OK to, to be like that in that area. Well, I'll tell you, the women that I know that have tried to get jobs at ESPN say that it's pretty bad there. Um, although I think most newsrooms have kind of cleaned all that stuff up. I had some pretty disgusting things happen to me when I was starting out in the business. And sometimes it's just to test you and, and see, uh, see how far you're going to, you know, what, what are you going to take? And if you can be accepted, sometimes you've got to take the bad joke kind of thing to be accepted into the group. Um, uh, whose responsibility is it? It's the company's responsibility to ensure that all the journalists are treated with respect. And I think if I was running a news organization and I heard that something like that had happened to one of my employees, I'd call up the team. And I'd say, hey, we got a problem. Um, but as far as the uh, kind of boys will be boys thing in the locker room, well, you know, there are a lot of women now who are considered to be really good sports reporters. And they should have access. And so I think the answer is have the news conference out outside the shower. That's a very easy fix right there. And give everybody uh, equal access to those players. But if you're going to say, well, I'm going to give you an interview in the sh you know, back here by the shower, um, you know, for the most part, a lot of women don't even want to go in there. They don't want to go in. They go, w they go where they need to go to get the interview. So I think it, it needs to be remedied by the teams as well as the news organizations sticking up for their, sticking up for their employees. Let me ask you a question. Does, how many people here trust the news? OK. <laughs> All right, I see one hand. <laughs> okay. And maybe you were just waving to somebody. No, <laughs> yeah. I mean, news is pretty broad, okay. I'd say. Trust. Can I ask some of you, why don't you trust the news? Go ahead. I think now it's more entertainment than information. OK. Um, and I, if you don't mind if I ask you, what news organizations do you think, if any, are devoid of political bias right now? Well, I think your local newscasts are probably working very hard to cover Philadelphia on a daily basis. Um, I think CBS, ABC, NBC, they're out there right now covering those fires. I don't think they're making anything up. I don't think they're being biased. I think they're just trying to cover the fires and the shattered lives of those people. Uh, the people in Puerto Rico, do you think they're making it up? No, there really are, you know, 85% of the people without power. Um, I don't think that's made up news. For personally, because I worked for PBS, and they're so, they're so boring, you know, but people <laughs> wanted news to be entertaining. That was part of the feedback they were getting from the audience. We have to compete with people who are taking it way out here. Uh, the Fox stations, local stations didn't want to emulate that. They did it to be able to stay competitive. And that's what you have to look at. A lot of that is just BS. 
and it's to keep everybody competitive. But if you really look at the reporters who are doing it out, doing the work in the field, I don't think any of them are making it up. I think they're just working really hard under hostile conditions to try to do the best job that they can. So I would probably start locally and find a good local station where the field reporting is, is honest and has integrity. I think the news anchor sets have become all about, let's just get them in the tent. Get them in the tent and then we'll give them the good stuff. But you know, the, the tent looks ridiculous in my opinion. Anybody else? Why don't you trust the news? In the back. Go ahead. Uh, I think for me, like, even this morning, like, I tried to look up news on, you know, I tried to learn more about the tax reform with Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. and I think I read an entire article based off of polls. Of what people were thinking. Right. And I feel like it's just gone again to go off what Jason said. I wasn't able to get any news. I wasn't able to get any facts about the situation. I was just reading what people were expressing themselves. Well, how many, where do you look online? Do you uh, Google normally search? I, I, normally I do CNN. Mm -hmm. I always trusted that as the way to get right to the facts. Mm -hmm. But they were the ones that were doing it. So I, I'm a big local television. I agree mm -hmm. to. I, I actually still watch at you know, 6 o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> great. Uh, but that's really all I, I look for. I try to get the news information and just I'd say broaden your search, you know, go to Reuters, go to the Associated Press. They're not making anything up, you know. It's funny to me, as a journalist, what do we get accused of making up the most? Oh, that's funny, White House reporting. Uh -huh. <laughs> the reporting that they disagree with. Nobody's saying that the sports guys are lying, or, you know, the people are doing sports are, they're, ma they're not making it up. You're not making up the scores, you're not making up <laughs> what's going on. So, I would say try and, eliminate as much of that flash that you see and go right for the heart of the story. Keep Google searching. Keep looking for Reuters and AP and other places or maybe even a tax, you know, a tax group that analyzes that kind of data. Go ahead. Go ahead. The only thing I have to say to you all, Pardon? Said, well, the only thing I have to say to, to respond to that is as a lawsuit, I don't have a ton of time. So well, that's, that's right. That's the hard part. That's is, right. Is jumping right. I just want to see the first article. Okay. Read it. Right. If it doesn't give me an opinion or facts, right. just stop going. And there are algorithms that they're all using to determine what you see first. It's called search engine optimization. Anybody here familiar with computers has heard of that. And these are the little formulas they use that say, what's going to be first in the Google search? What's going to hit first? And people pay for that, and people use little tricks for that. And yeah. All these polling companies have these little tricks they have that make sure you see that story first. And I know it's hard because you probably all have very little time in your lives. But you know, if you can carve out a little bit, um, I would say try and just search a little deeper. And more importantly, before you pass it on to your friends, uh, run it by Snopes or Politi PolitiFact or some of these other organizations that will tell you wh whether it's true or not. I have a friend, and he's so smart. But all this garbage ends up in my mailbox every day that he's forwarding me. And it's the kind of stuff like the pizza parlor and the sex ring. And I keep sending it back to him saying, look, just check it, dude. There's like Snopes, OK? That'll pretty much tell you right out of the gate whether it's real or not. But he doesn't. <laughs> but it's a, listen, you're going to be lawyers. You're going to need to be informed. You're going to need to. Our democracy is dependent upon an informed citizenry. It's never been more important that, that you guys have the information to make good decisions about the world you live in. So although it's not convenient, I urge all of you to be better consumers of, of the news. Go ahead. Do you think part of the problem is there's just too much news right now? I mean, I know back in my parents' generation, they had the morning news, there was noon at lunch, and the evening news. Right. And they would just report on like the Puerto Rico crisis or the wildfires out west. Now it's around the clock, and I think part of the issue is you have to fill this you know, huge gap with a lot of opinion pieces. I think what you saw happen with, uh, where you saw that really emerge was with cable news, because they don't run programs and soap operas and TV shows. They are running 24-7 what they call news programming. But the news, what happens is a journalist will go out and do a story, say on CNN, and do a really good piece, and they check it, and it's, and it's, it's absolutely solid. And they bring, and they sit them on the set, 
and they give the piece, and they say, well, that was a really, really great piece now. And then they bring in four people to yell about it for the next 20 minutes, right? So I always tell people, if you watch the news and people are yelling, it's not a news program, it's an opinion program. And they always pick the most extreme <coughs> ends of the spectrum to uh, sit on that set because they know they're going to flare it up, just like they knew if they trained cameras on Donald Trump during his candidacy that he was good for sound bites, which were going to make, uh, make money for them. You know, every time you watch a program, your little TV set is sending a signal back and they're registering that that program got watched. They call them ratings, and so they make money off of that. If you're online and you want to read a story and you have to hit 25 pages to read the whole thing, you know what I'm talking about, right? The pop-ups yeah, and click-throughs. it's click fake. I mean, it's, it's got very, very little, very, I say very little meat and mostly sugar. You know, it's just sugar. And every time you click, they're making money. They call it clickbait. So every time you click on, on, on a story, they're making money. Some newspapers will uh, have a very solid story by a journalist. And then after that, say, any comments? What they don't tell you is some of the employees begin to make comments to get a reaction from you. And then you're going to come in and you're going to say, well, I think this story sucks. Right? Or I don't like this, or you know, or this is right on, and then you'll go back. They know you're going to come back and say, "Did anybody respond to that? Did anybody say anything else?" That's clickbait. So what they're not telling you is sometimes those responses are phony. They're being made by employees, and it's just designed to get you coming back to the paper, coming back to the page, coming back to the page, because that's how they make make money. So yeah, there's way more news, news than there used to be. Um, but I would argue that there's less solid journalism and a lot more heat than light, a lot more style over substance kind of thing. Anybody else? It is very scary when I'll, I'll go to my Facebook account and see an ad for something I was just looking at. Oh, yeah. Isn't like it? a bag or right. a, yeah. You go and visit a site, as many as 160 cookies are following you out of there. They're yeah. selling you. you it's know? amazing. So, all of a sudden, right, you were at the territory head or Abercrombie or something. And something here's like that. that. And it's funny, it's just what I was looking at. Yes. Right? So it tells you that when you're surfing the internet, everyone's surfing with you now because they are mining your data. That's why it's, you know, click if you agree or, you know, what do you think of this? You know, they're just mining you for data that they can then sell to third parties. So that's something to be aware of. Anybody else? Last question. I know you got to run. What's the future of journalism? I think it's sitting in this room. <laughs> no, seriously, it's you. You're the future of, of journalism. You're the future of, of law. You're the future of journalism. And it's going to be people like you that are going to say, this has to change. This has to be better. We have to be more honest in our reporting, more diverse in our reporting. We have to be uh, more welcoming to differing opinions. The problem is the First Amendment was designed not to protect speech you like. It was designed to protect speech you don't like. Uh, for instance, do you ever hear of Charlie Hebdo, the French magazine, where, oh, you know what Mad Magazine is, right? Picture Mad Magazine with some really dirty pictures in it. And that was Charlie Hebdo. It was a, it's a paper in, in Paris, and they are famous for just drawing disgusting pictures of politicians and writing these articles. And you know, you either read it or you don't read it, but it's there. And to, but some gunmen broke into the offices two years ago and killed 12 people and injured a bunch of others. Uh, because they were offended that they had made fun of Mohammed as part of everything else that they make fun of. And so they came in and slaughtered all these people in the newsroom. And it was funny, but the world wept with them. And it wasn't because, wow, we're really going to miss their disgusting pictures. It's because that's what the First Amendment protects. It protects the speech you don't like. And that's why it's so important in a democracy that we have speech that not only we agree with, but speech we disagree with, and that we have a mechanism by which we can have discourse around that, discourse around those ideas, and hopefully learn from each other. But if we're all going to polarize each other into our particular camps, it just grows the divide rather than bringing us closer together. And when you say they're the solution, you mean younger people demanding a difference? 
yes. demanding change. Yes, and you're going to do it. You guys are all going to get out of here, and you are the future. You're going to make it. You're going to tell. You're going to be the ones that decide how you want this world to be, and you're going to have the power. You, who knows what you're going to go into? Right now, you think it's sports law, but you might end up being politicians or corporate lawyers or journalism lawyers. But you're going to be there defending the First Amendment, and you're going to be able to hold people in power accountable. Um, and that's the best part, I think, of, of looking at you and knowing that you are all going to be the ones that are going to say, look, we've been watching this, and it has to change, no matter what it is. No matter whether it's about the athletes or whether it's about your politicians, you have the power. And, and you know, I'm just very excited to be here and see all these you know, young faces looking back at me because I know that, that you're going to be the ones that are going to be holding everybody accountable in the future. And hopefully, listening to me and listening to your professor and listening to all these different voices, you're going to be able to decide for yourselves what's really important and what news should be. Anyone else? <laughs> Anybody else? What would you like to see more of in the news? Go ahead. Um, something that really bothers me is, I think you mentioned Twitter's kind of an echo chamber. Mm -hmm. And um, last year, Chuck Todd was here, and he said his favorite time to go on Twitter was 4 a.m. to 5 a.m. because it was all the major news outlets just putting out stuff that wasn't any individual personal pieces or whatever. And I think now it's, it's so easy to get verified on Twitter. Um, there are people that their full-time job is pretty much responding to politicians and criticizing them on Twitter um, on both sides, and people just just get enamored with, with these accounts, and they, it's kind of like the fake news on Facebook, and people believe these accounts, and it ends up... It, it ends up just kind of bleeding into the culture, and people accept these things. And, and more and more younger people use social media for news, and I don't see... You can't tell Twitter to stop this or Facebook to stop this, and I just don't see a remedy right now to fix that problem. Well, I'm not sure the remedy is here yet. Uh, you know, the problem is there are so many outlets now, and as I said about the Inquirer earlier, it was a funny newspaper. Everybody was in on the joke, right? But now that's right next to the New York Times. Yeah. They are giving uh, press credentials to Breitbart to come into the presidential news conferences. They're giving them this false equivalency. I'm sure that's a word you guys have heard in your, in your classes. But they provide them, they, you know, false equivalency, saying, well, your, your, your news outlet is just as good as this. No, it's not. It's not. And I say just be, be good consumers. Be aware of when you're getting manipulated. Look at your feed and compare it to your friends and say, isn't that funny, huh? They're telling you different stories than they're telling me. Why would they do that? Well, it's always aimed at selling. So, you know, part of it is going to be people taking charge and, I don't know, will they make news a public utility? What, will, they, will they have an organization that, like, is, like Consumers Union, is going to vet all the stories before um, they let them out? I don't know. I don't know that the answer is here. I know there are good news organizations out there because it was my world. But for people like you, it can often be very difficult to determine and decide what is real here and what's not. So, that's why I say read widely, as our colleague just said in our uh, panel, read widely and read skeptically. And be willing to entertain diverse points of view. Even if you love democracy now, go ahead and watch Fox News anyway, just so you hear what people are talking about, so that you're not surprised when you get into the world and realize there are people with very different viewpoints. You know, the people of Philadelphia are looking at news very differently than the people in Oklahoma. You know, and so it, it is all part of the culture we live in, but it's very important that the, the more widely you are exposed to different points of views, the better you'll be able to understand the world when you get out into it. We know you got to catch a plane. Thanks so much for staying. Oh, you're so Thanks welcome. to Ginger. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it is concerning everything we're hearing, and you guys consume enough. I don't think the word is news, I think the word is media. Uh, everything look at as media now. You all have your screens in front of you now. It's, it's ubiquitous. Uh, there's articles everywhere how it's changed our lives. Uh, and there's no looking back. So I guess the question is, how do you control it going forward? How do you have your own filters? Um, 
as you said, your law students. I mean, everyone's, everyone's busy, right? So everyone's busy, and everyone wants to get their hit of news, their hit of sports, their hit of social, whatever they can, and everybody's vying for those eyeballs. Uh, it's a tough world. When I started writing for Sports Illustrated, this MMQB website, our mantra in 2014 was, we're not going to worry about clicks, OK? We're going to do good journalism. We're going to do stories that other people don't do. We're going to do long form. We're going to do 2,000 words. We're, gonna, we're not going to worry about clicks. But of course, what happens? Corporations get involved. Time Inc. sends the word down. We're not getting enough clicks. So shorter stories, bigger framed headlines, keywords, search engine optimization. That's what happens. You know, all good intentions get compromised by business concerns. Uh, even on ESPN, there's times where I'll go out uh, and I'll have my earpiece, and they'll say, you know, about tough, tough issues. And I'll hear my producer as I walk out say, Andrew, dumb it down. Dumb it down. <laughs> In other words, telling me I can't talk to the camera like I'm talking to you guys. It's too much. It's too heavy. And I would say to the producers, like, this is pretty dense stuff, whether we're talking about lawsuits, whether we're talking about concussion issues, whatever's going on in sports law, sports business. And I would say to these producers, like, we, we got dense stuff. We need time. Andrew, you know who you're talking to, which was a way of saying to me, I'm talking to the lowest common denominator, you know? You're talking to bars. <laughs> You're talking to guys sleeping in their fraternities, whatever. So uh, it's where we're going because of business concerns. You get the most hits. ESPN, we always, obviously, we knew what would draw eyeballs. Talk about LeBron, talk about Tebow, talk about the Dallas Cowboys, talk about things that people care about. Never talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. I said, well, what if they're good? No one cares. OK. They'd say, you know, I'd say something like, there's a big story I want to cover. It's about this NH NHL and something. No, no one cares about hockey. OK. <laughs> so sometimes you just have to compromise. Uh, this is exactly what she's saying, where news is going. Everybody wants the biggest hit they can. It's the chicken or the egg, right? People would say about media, not sports media, it's all Trump. Of course. Chicken or the egg. Trump draws. Trump's a magnet. Trump's the accident on the side of the road that people can't stop looking at. Of course. It's all Trump. Is it the chicken or the egg? It's the chicken, whatever, the, which one it is, because that's what you want. You being the mass viewership. Radio, TV, they, they do every little minute. There's a guy on NFL Network, a former player named Deion Sanders. Deion's a loud, brash guy. Okay, great player. They have metrics that say every time he comes on the air, we spike ratings. He drives the product. Every time he says something, every time he's on the air, our ratings go up. So what happens? Deion Sanders is on more and more. And Deion Sanders has a huge contract. Of course he does. You can move the needle like that, of course. Other guys, not so much. So I just think we're in a, we're in a time right now where, echoing what she said, whether it's fake news, whatever, it's drama, whether it's, it's business. And this exactly leads into what happens with the NFL this week. We have the owners and players meeting. Uh, the owners, they're like, as we've been talking about, this standing for the anthem, it's turning off our sponsors. It's turning off our fans. It's bad for business. 
And the players are like, well, you got to hear our concerns. OK, so what did they do the past two days? They met. And as I started to class, I have never seen owners and players in the same room. Never. Never. You know, maybe the same team, sign a big contract, the owner comes in, shakes his hand, take a picture. But this is actual conversation. So we're to, we're to, it's a significant moment for sports, similar to other sports as well. The only time they really get together is when we talk about a collective bargaining situation, which is very antagonistic and usually spoken through lawyers, usually lawyers. And this whole Ezekiel Elliott thing, or Ray Rice, or Tom Brady, they talk through lawyers. This was some very thoughtful and outspoken players. You've heard about them, Malcolm Jenkins, Chris Long, Michael Bennett, Doug Baldwin, others sitting across from NFL owners. Jeffrey Lurie, Jerry, Jerry Jones actually wasn't in that meeting, but Arthur Blank of the Falcons, Stephen Ross of the, of the Dolphins, Rooney of the Steelers, Mara of the Giants. And that was, to me, that's historic. Now, whether they come out of it with, there's pretty general, right? There's no specifics. But they're not going to stand. Now, let me rephrase that. They are not any more required to stand for the anthem than they were before these meetings. What do I always say? Policy and precedent. Policy and precedent has not changed. For whatever reason, they didn't think of this however many years ago they put this policy in place, right? Who would ever thought of this? That we should discipline for not standing for the anthem. So that hasn't changed. Now, will players still kneel? Some. Not a lot. Not a lot. But not everyone's going to stand. And then we get into the Jerry Jones, the, the Cowboys owner, who has said on record last week, drew a line in the sand, said, if you don't stand, you don't play. So what kind of legal and practical implications are that? On the practical side, you've got to think, well, wait. Really, Dak Prescott? You're not going to play him if he sits for the anthem or kneels? Or more importantly, what if there's a revolt? What if 30 players kneel? Are they going to forfeit the game? And then you look at the legal implications. We have league policy that says you don't have to stand. And we have a team policy that says you do. Where's the legalities there? To me, that's an interesting legal question. What would happen if a player brought a grievance against the Cowboys saying that they didn't follow the league, which is the rule? And if you're a player, are you looking at your team or are you looking at the league? So all these little permutations are coming up now that the NFL is embracing players, at least for dialogue. Okay, at least for dialogue. Okay, so this issue is dominating discussion. I know I'm going to talk about it tomorrow at noon with the, with the whole school group, but um, Sarah, we have a few people talking about it now, right? Yeah. Who is arguing on behalf of the players? Okay. Um, And how do we frame this? Because <laughs> there's so many ways to frame it, right? Should they? Kind of just said, be prepared for an open discussion. So yeah. Wherever you want to take with it. And who's talking for the owners? One, two, three. OK. I'm not trying to put anyone in awkward positions. Just want to have us have a discussion about how many issues this permutates and why, why this is such an important issue in sports law right now. OK, so let's start with you, and we'll keep going back and forth. 
Okay, um, so when I was, uh, you know, just kind of following this over the past week and everything, um, it kind of got me thinking uh, back to the couple weeks uh, where we had that professor come in yeah. um, talking about social justice and social reform revolutions. And I kind of saw that um, in a connection with what um, Brandon Copeland said when he, when he was talking about how he uses his platform to kind of help his career, just like his platform as an NFL player to help his career outside of football, you know, I kind of see this movement of Colin Kaepernick and others who are kneeling, walking arms, fist in the air, yeah. as using their platform as NFL players to make a statement about, you know, what they think about uh, our, our country and what they think about our problems in the communities that they come from. So it's unreasonable to not allow them to use their platform because when, you know, uh, the the professor said, um, you know, kind of jarring phrase like uh, dance for me. Boy. Yeah. You know, that's a terrible image and a terrible thing to think of. But, you know, at the same time, it's, it's for us, it's just sports. And, you know, a lot of people would say, you know, like, you're, 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 you're an athlete. I, you know, you're here for, like, my entertainment. This is sports industry. It's for viewers. It's the complete opposite for them. It's their, like, we, we see that as viewers, just fans. But for them, it's their career, it's their job, and it's their life. So to deny them the right to, to use that, to use their life and their, their platform as a, for their job, it just, it, it just doesn't seem right. OK. Response from ownership? I forgot your name. Priscilla. Priscilla. So um, I think there's a pretty strong argument that uh, players are paid actors um, in, in a way. Um, and there's obviously constitutional free speech, but here we have what can be considered a contractual free speech. OK. Um, so I mean, there, it's an employee-employer uh, type of Right. So your feeling is they're employees, they're there to do their jobs, and this is outside their scope of employment. I think from the player side, this gets even further complicated with all of Trump's right. very, very vocal opinions on the matter, because now you're getting into the, the government actually trying to enforce rules through these employers. Like you're having Trump say these things, and now more than even prior to this, this First Amendment violation becomes really real because the government is trying to influence how these private employers are, you know, having their right. employees act. Okay. Owner response to that? Go ahead. I'm trying to think how. So you, owners or lead? Like, am I looking at yeah, I mean, we, perspective or like Jerry Jones perspective? What were you told? <laughs> what did we tell? It just said lead. Yeah, I think I from. Say owners. I actually don't remember. I just remember it was the tape on the side. Yeah, either one. Either one. Well, I think from an owner's perspective, there's not like I agree with what she said. Like there's like it's inside the scope of employment where the employee, the employer, gets to decide. Like, but if if the two are conflicting, where right the CBA or I remember I've seen your tweets about how they. The policy is that technically that players only encouraged right. to stand, not required to. But if an owner requires you to stand, I'm not really sure what takes precedent. Or right. Takes, um, well, there's certainly forget whatever law there is. If an owner requires you to stand, as Priscilla said, that's your job. So, is that your point that yeah. it doesn't really matter what what your personal social viewpoints are? I mean, I think the prudent owner would just allow their uh, players to stand because I think it's like a, it's not that big of a deal in the long term if you just let them kneel and then. Uh, but say it, it, it's become a big deal because of, yeah. because fans don't want it, sponsors don't want it. I understand that. I think it's one of those short term. Um, Issues that long term would kind of go away because of the quick news cycle. Okay. Something else becomes the next big issue. Uh, like, who, who knows? Like, you go back to concussions where, where that's the big issue in sports. Like, it kind of changes all the time. Right. So, I, I think that if I was an owner, I would allow my players to stand. But 
from a league aspect, I understand you have to look at it from, a, from the business aspects where you have to look at who your base are. Like, for instance, the NBA allowing their uh, players, per, like, I'm pretty sure Adam Silver came out and just said you have to stand. That was in the Constitution or the bylaws or Which policy. is pretty surprising considering the NBA, average NBA fan, I would say is definitely more left-leaning compared to the average NFL fan, which I would definitely say is probably more along the right side, which unfortunately that's what this issue has come down to, or it seems at least like the right side is pro-militarization of the anthem almost, like if you don't respect Well, the that's the conflating, like Ash, Ashley, right? What she was talking about with conflating the patriotism and social and military, and that's gotten in the way, clearly. Yeah, so I mean, it's hard to differentiate between that. Uh, honestly, if I was a league, I would consider just getting rid of the anthem. It sounds crazy, but... It, I'm getting rid of you know, the anthem or getting rid of players on the field for the anthem, or...? I mean, honestly, if you look at people who sit, go through concession stands, they're not right. watching the anthem. Uh, there are a lot of people who have always kind of just done their own things to respect the anthem, and I think it just created a way too weird of a problem. It's not always been a, like I'm pretty sure like until like 2008, they didn't even sing the national anthem before games, if I'm correct, or something. Well, like I remember, I mean, I, I'm much older. I remember it as a kid, but. I, I read recently though that it's a new. Maybe thing. not, and not with the pomp and circumstance, yeah. yeah. So. I don't understand why we have to conflate patriotism in sports almost, but I do understand kind of both sides. Like you want to respect your military if you're going to have this anthem. And then if you also, if you respect, if you're going against it, it's kind of hard to find. To no, it is. That's, so that's from the league side, I would good say conversation. Yeah. Different implication for the league and the owner. Like if I was an owner, I would just allow it. But if I was the league side, I would consider more crazy ramifications, crazy uh, ideas back. Right. Jack, player side? Yeah, just to kind of touch on that, like I think Ben was kind of right in the sense when he was saying that uh, the issue will most likely change, you know, like it'll be kind of uh, swept aside by something that comes up, maybe it's concussions again, but whatever. I think that the biggest thing though is that the player's platform is going to change, and the fact that the players kind of have the opportunity now with this issue to prove that like, hey, we have a platform and we can make it valuable, we can change it into or use it for some kind of means of social change is my biggest issue because um, you know, like they didn't really know what to do. It wasn't very well organized. It wasn't really thought out. No one feels comfortable with it necessarily. People don't want to talk about it. People do want to talk about it. <laughs> and players are kind of saying, like, hey, like we have this opportunity to prove that us as athletes have a valuable voice, a voice that should be heard and listened to. And I think they kind of squandered that opportunity. Like, I, no, nothing really is coming of this. Like, there was actually a good article on the Players Tribune, and it was finally a, a football player saying, like, hey, like. You know, let's at least get organized if we're going to talk about this. Yeah. yeah, Russell Okun, yeah. who was at the meeting. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so uh, I mean, like, I, I'd like to see that, you know, in the future, players will use their platform for good, but I worry that they took this opportunity and kind of squandered it because now people will be like, well, players don't know what to do either. They're just as confused as we are. They're half the world stand, half the will. Well, uh, before I get to you, we'll go back to Glenn Bracey, who sat here and again was a very jarring conversation. He did say something that, that I, resonated with me. These are the most, what did he call them, most well-known or richest or people of color in the country. Uh, and that gives them a voice and that gives them power. So this is a way of exercising that power. Like you said, what's the tangibility out of the power? What happened? And I will say, I'll get to a couple things that come out of this meeting. Uh, and I just did a podcast with Jim Trotter of ESPN, who's at the meeting. He come out, he's come out with a couple tangibles. So something is happening. I think we're looking at it and saying, what are you getting out of this? But to the player population, they probably, maybe, maybe they feel a little or, unorganized, but they feel like we're getting some out of it because these owners, these billionaires, these rich men that want to tell us just play football, they're taking it more seriously. I mean, I would think they think that's something. Yeah. Yeah, I'm also on the player side, but yeah. I actually do think they're making some progress. I think the last two days or three days have probably been the best right. they've had this entire time. Um, this was originally, I think there was originally supposed to be a vote on this rule change. 
Yeah, we thought this would be about standing or sitting, but it has become a different. Well, and I think John Merritt just told a reporter that they're not going to take a vote anymore. Um, and on Monday, they actually. They're not going to what now? Take a vote. On? Whether to adopt a rule required. Oh, I see. OK. Yeah. Um, and on Monday, the NFL endorsed the drafting German criminal reform bill. Um, it's basically about like, uh, the criminal justice system. Fixing prison sentences for non-violent drug offenders, uh, and that's much closer to Kaepernick's like original vision yeah. for why he uh, sat down or slashed the Yeah. Um, so I guess it's a good sign that even though it's become conflated, that at least some. Yeah, there's a tangible, and that they sent a letter signed by Roger Goodell and Doug Baldwin uh, to the senators' offices that supported that. Uh, that would have never happened. I, I can be pretty confident in saying that. That would have never happened. But for whatever this is, but for Kaepernick, but for this. So there is something. Uh, we also had 40, it's ironic, it's the 49ers, but 49ers, Jen Yeah. Both is one of the proudest states that's ever had. Yeah. And that's an issue, too. We have. Owners, sometimes we think it's players versus owners. Sometimes it's owners versus owners that we've talked about with some of these cases. Uh, owners versus owners, like the Cubs case and the Finley case, where they don't feel as, as strongly about one team as another. Well, here we go. You know, the 49ers, I'm as proud as I've ever been to be in these meetings. I don't think Jerry Jones feels that way. I don't think some of these other owners feel that way. Some boycotted the meeting. Uh, Carolina's owner, and the rumor was, nothing substantiated, that he did not want to feel like he was being an equal. He did not want to come to these meetings and be equal with players. Again, we can have our own opinion on that. Here's a 70, 89, 90-year-old guy that says players have always been our, you know, lower level. We're the owners. Yesterday, today, they're equals. So I think you drill, you drill deeper, as you just did, you see some, some change. Other thoughts? From, yeah. It's kind of tough to really say exactly what you think about this, because they're not usually the ones in the spotlight, except for Jerry Jones. And right. Kraft, and people kind of know what they think. But um, I feel that the NFL is probably doing the best or pursuing the best possible solution at this point, unless the only one of the only solutions left is to make this a dialogue, because it's too late to get out in front of it. It's already one of the biggest issues uh, in the media, and everyone knows about it. So I feel like they're doing what they can to try to mitigate what is happening, short of any extreme solution, like forcing everyone to stand. And it's really one of the only places that they can go is to talk about it with people. And a lot of people are angry that Colin Kaepernick wasn't included. I'm not really sure why that was. Maybe it's just to kind of keep it, um, again, maybe some damage control trying to keep it from the issue from getting more inflamed and having him involved in right. uh, just trying to, um, not necessarily that Colin Kaepernick isn't level-headed, that he's very intelligent, um, but that at least in the public eye, for people who aren't involved in this, that Colin Kaepernick is seen as one of the most passionate people about this. And so maybe to get him involved might kind of send up the wrong message. Um, but I think that the NFL is probably just doing what they can at this yeah. point. I think longtime watchers of the NFL uh, business are pretty surprised right now that they would take in these meetings, treat players as equals, listen. We're talking about you know signing letters with a player. You know Doug Baldwin of the Seattle Seahawks, pretty thoughtful guy is on the same letterhead with Roger Goodell to a, to a senator. I don't think that's ever happened. Um, we do equate that power with NBA more because the magnitude of LeBron, the magnitude of some of the superstars, uh, these are players that we would not put in superstar category necessarily. I don't think any of them. Uh, and they're having a seat at the table, and they're <laughs> signing a letter with the commissioner.
That's one side of it. The, the other side of it is I run into a lot of people, probably more than the other side, that say, why don't they stick to sports? Even people today said what Priscilla just said. Hey, listen, they're employees. What if you did something on your job like that? You'd be out. Yeah, Ashley. I think the counter to that, though, is that a lot of their contracts and things like that like, have aspects off the field as well. Like they have to do community service. Right. You can't you know, inappropriately represent the organization. Like they have so many caveats that are so similar to life off the field that it's kind of ridiculous to say that like, you, know, you have to represent, you represent us off the field. Oh, by the way, just stick to what you're doing off the field. Right. Right. I mean, you can take this all the way, like you said, the jarring comment about dance for me boy is really saying to players, know where your, know where your place is. Uh, and in this divisive time we live in, as she talked about with the president, to buck up like that, I think, is, is, is risky and shows some power. It is obviously risky. You know these careers in sports, two to three years. Uh, and like I said, none of them are superstars. But having said that, the Eagles aren't going to cut Malcolm Jenkins. The Eagles aren't going to cut Chris Long. The Seahawks aren't going to cut Doug Baldwin. They are good enough to be able to do this. But they don't have star status. What would be interesting is we see one of these players really come out as as part of this as a superstar. You know, would, would a Brady, would a Breeze, would a Cam Newton be part of this? Because that's what works with these owners, it's gravitas. I mean, clearly having LeBron as vice president of the union, Chris Paul as president of the union made a huge difference in their bargaining, huge. Yeah. Um, so why do you think that players such as Tom Brady or Cam Newton, the big superstars, had sport like Tom Brady couldn't get and you couldn't find anything on this? He's friends with he's the awesome. he's friends with the president to yeah. begin with, but. Um, but how come any other superstars? Who might be I don't know. I mean, listen. I, I wrote about Aaron's injury. Um, I know Aaron Rodgers a long time. He was very supportive of Kaepernick. Um, in the ESPN article, he talked about it. He was very on the record about it. Uh, the question is, I guess you're asking is why would he go beyond that uh, into more of an activist role like you see some of these players? I don't know. I, th I think the one thing about Aaron was very clear to me uh, is that he knows when he speaks, he speaks for 60 guys in the locker room. He speaks for the team. He speaks for the NFL. He speaks for the state of Wisconsin. He speaks for this vast Packer nation. And he's very conscious of his remarks. I don't think he's bland like Brady. Uh, I just think he's going to go to a point and not further. I think Brady's bland. I think Breeze is bland. You know, and I think a lot of these superstars are pretty bland. I think Cam Newton is the one that could probably bridge that gap. He he's, can be an outspoken guy. Uh, does he feel this way? I don't know. But you know, there are probably others in that category. And again, I put on my agent hat. And that's where all these things come together. It's like the agent's the gateway. And would I allow my player to be outspoken about this? I don't know. I'd hope he would want to be. I'd hope he'd have enough confidence in his ability and confidence in his position to do that. But could it be career suicide like Kaepernick? I don't know. Um, ultimately, it does come down to the, the caliber of player. Like I said, the Eagles aren't going to cut Malcolm Jenkins. He's one of their best players. If Malcolm Jenkins raised his fist as a third stringer, I don't know if he'd be here. Jason. I, I was just uh, thinking that probably the reason why some of uh, Mr. Gracie said was that Republicans 
by sneakers too. And a lot of these guys, if they take a position, they're they fear, they fear maybe retribution from endorsement deals or something else. I mean, you look at the number one selling jersey for a week was uh, Villanueva and the Steelers. Um, and I think if you put yourself out there, you're kind of you're at risk for losing some of the excess or the other income besides uh, your salary if you're one of these big big time players. And I think that's another issue with this is that the longer it stays in the spotlight. It's going to adversely impact not just owners but also players too because sponsors, people are going to, you already hear about boycott the NFL, this, for this reason or that reason. I think they need, both sides need to come to a solution because economically this isn't going to work out. I think it's going to go well. Yeah. And like we were just talking about with the news, I think people are very, one thing I will say about viewers and readers, even though we're critical that they just go for the sugar. I think we're in a society right now that is more, let me say this, I think has a better BS meter than ever before. I think we, at least smart people, <laughs> well, people are very, they can see through BS. And I've noticed this with athletes, the way people view athletes. So I just think when people see authenticism, that really resonates. Um, and sometimes when we see star players stand up and take a stand, I think sometimes we see through that. Uh, what are they really saying? And are they going back to a safer position? Um, I think I've always been impressed where people put their money where their mouth is, people put their causes out front. I keep coming back to this guy at the Eagles, uh, Malcolm Jenkins. He does ride-alongs with police. He has colloquialisms, colloquials with police. Uh, he is going to Capitol Hill every couple months. I mean, he's invested, right? And what people have a problem with is athletes, like you said, Republicans buy shoes too. They're just doing it because it's, it's the flavor of the month. Um, and I think even though we are duped by fake news or whatever, I think we as a society, because there is so much information, we do have good BS meters. I think there's, that has grown in our society. Yeah. Uh, another thing I want to add, though, I think something that would be really interesting to see is Chris Long, if he came out today, he's doing his whole uh, salary. Yeah. If an NFL owner said, I want to match yeah. the amount of money he's putting toward it, he's doing that educationally quality and accounting on charge of an owner and they easily could afford it said you know here's a proactive step we're gonna take I think a good faith gesture that yeah really good. what Jason's talking about Chris Long on the Eagles has already donated six game checks to Charlottesville where he grew up uh, and then took the last ten so it's his entire salary we're going to go Philadelphia St. Louis and uh, Boston, all places he's lived recently, uh, towards racial equality. That's some serious stuff, you know? And people are cynical, I get it. You know, I'm, I put that out on Twitter, people come back, well, his dad's rich, whatever. Okay, Howie Long from Villanova, right? But come on, that's a serious commitment. And yes, if owners match that, that's a way that we could have again another part progress. I think he makes, I don't know what he makes, a million and a half dollars or whatever he makes. An owner, you know, if theoretically owners could deal with that. Yes? You just spoke earlier about kind of your experience at ESPN, um, kind of the hierarchy telling you that you're appealing to the lowest common denominator. I'm just kind of interested if any of the owners in the NFL actually see all of this as like a good thing. As what? That they see this as, as a good thing for their, their future. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, like you said, if that's who they're trying to appeal to, then this is what people want to eat up. They like drama to go along with the sports they want. Yes. It's just like it, it reminds me of the fact that like everyone watched like Conor McGregor fight. You know, Mayweather. Yeah. Then, like, the month later, there was another fight between it was, like, Alvarez versus yeah. like, or something. Two, like, high-level boxers. And it, it didn't get anywhere near the, the viewership numbers. And that was, right. you know, it was 
just because you know that other fight had all of that drama built up around it. So I'm wondering if any owners are saying, you know, at least in my experiences, people are talking about these protests. People were talking about whether Tom Brady was a cheater or not to play game. Who like never watched the football right. in their life. So I'm just wondering if they're thinking that at the end of the day, you know, no publicity is bad for this. Yes. I think we've seen that kind of manifest itself over and over again in media and that's something that could be at play. You've got the start of the NBA season, you've got baseball playoffs, you've got the start of the NHL season, and at least from what I can tell, again back to ESPN, which drives conversation, everyone's talking about this. Everyone's talking about this. <laughs> um, and yeah, I would think there's some N NBA and baseball and hockey and college sports people saying, come on. <laughs> but. This is what drives, you're right. Uh, after the Ray Rice fiasco, after the, the video, that year, 2014, ratings up, metrics up. After the Tom Brady shenanigans, ratings, prosperity up. After the movie Concussion, ratings, prosperity up. Now there's some downturn in ratings right now a little bit, but we'll see where it goes. Um, you know, I think the, it's going to hurt ratings more than any of this stuff is like Aaron Rodgers being hurt or Odell Beckham being hurt. But we'll see. I still think there's a lot of leagues that just wish they had the problems of the NFL. I don't know. I mean, these baseball playoff games are going to get a fraction of what a normal Sunday football game gets. Think about that. A baseball World Series game is going to get about half what an average Sunday game gets. I mean, a good Sunday afternoon national game. So you're right. It's all chicken and egg, and it just seems like we're talking about it. Obviously, it's my background, so I talk about it more. But uh, it is dominating conversation. The, like I said, the dean asked me to talk about it tomorrow here. Um, so that's what we're doing. And having said that, we probably talked about it enough today, <laughs> unless anyone asked someone else. Any questions, comments from anyone that was assigned? OK. Let's just take five minutes, and then we'll go another 20 minutes, 25 minutes. OK, five minutes. Uh, antitrust and whether baseball was subject to antitrust laws, we have the famous two cases from the Supreme Court. One, of course, federal baseball, which talks about baseball being a game rather than a business. The travel was mere incident. There's nothing about it that's a business. And basically setting up what we've referred to as the baseball antitrust exemption. 1922, Oliver Wendell Holmes. We have cases following that that set up the cat and mouse that I've talked about between the legislative branch and the judicial branch. Neither side willing, able, or ready to take on this antitrust exemption for 50 years, up until 72, when the Kurt Flood case hits. And the Kurt Flood case hits, and Kurt Flood is this sports law pioneer paving the way for free agency. But he actually, in, in reality, lost the case. As the justices said, we realize, I think one of their language was very poignant language that this baseball antitrust exemption is derelict in the stream of law, but they were unable, unwilling to overturn it. Again, the cat and mouse saying if they're going to overturn it, it's got to come from the legislature, Congress, not from the courts. So we have two Supreme Court cases out of what I keep saying is maybe five in the history of, of law involving sports here that baseball is still exempt from antitrust law. And as I said, Kurt Flood becomes a name in sports law because he paved the way for free agency. So basically what happened was free agency came about not because of Kurt Flood, but he spurred it along with his case. And it had to come from an arbitration rather than a court case. And the arbitration was two pitchers for the Dodgers. Uh, I think one was the Dodgers, one was another team, Messersmith McNally against Major League Baseball. Who's talking about that? Your name? John. John. John.
John. Okay, John, yeah. All right, so this originally started off with John Messersmith, who was a pitcher for the Dodgers. Andy. Uh, what? Andy. Andy? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so we had some contract disputes with the Dodgers and ended up not reaching an agreement in the year prior to all of this. Right. So the Dodgers exercised their option to sign him um, into his reserve year, and that reserve year is going to be the big dispute. Um, and so the Players Association filed a grievance at the end of the following season because Messer Smith argued that he was now a free agent after that reserve year expired. And the Dodgers are basically saying, well, we can exercise this reserve year in perpetuity. Right. And so they filed a grievance for Messer Smith and then end up joining um, McNally as well um, in the event that Messer Smith reaches an agreement because he's kind of a pretty good player. Whereas McNally is retired because he's also a good pitcher. Um, and so the um, grievance went to an arbitrator's sites. Um, and the big issue was interpretive and uh, what this clause means, mm -hmm. the reserve clause, which is just a group of um, parts of the agreement, which allows um, teams to exercise the reserve option if they can't reach an agreement and basically just take the player for one more year. And instead of allowing this to be exercised in perpetuity, the arbitrator found for Messer Smith and McNally and said that you're a free agent at the end of that reserve year. Okay. So we have a major case here. Again, important points here beyond the result, which is one, it's not from a court, it's not from Supreme Court, any court, it's from an arbitration. And here's the background that I, is not in these slides, but you need to know. We talk a lot about unions. This was the beginning of the baseball union, led by a union leader from other unions named Marvin Miller. Marvin Miller, who also led the case of Kurt Flood, he is a lawyer and he got a collective bargaining agreement with Major League Baseball way back in the 70s. And for most of the terms of the agreement, as you would expect, he had zero leverage. <laughs> Baseball players had no leverage. They got some minimum salaries. This reserve clause stayed in these contracts. Bad CBA for the players, except for this. What he got for Major League Baseball players back in the 70s is something that NFL players still haven't got. Does anyone know what that is? When there's a dispute between the players and the teams, where does it go to? Where does it go to in the NFL? To the commissioner. Where does it go to in baseball? Independent arbitrator. So the owners gave him this <laughs> in bargaining way back. Said if there's a dispute between players and owners, it will go to arbitration and that arbitrator will not be the commissioner, will not be on the side of the owners. That arbitrator will be selected jointly by the owners and the players in the form of an independent arbitrator. And they have a panel of independent arbitrators they randomly pick one for each case that comes up. And this one, they picked a guy named Peter Seitz, who's a lawyer. Usually these arbitrators are lawyers, professors, scholars. And Peter Seitz looks at this case and he looks at this reserve clause that we talked about before, which says the team can reserve you next year. And he interprets it as we interpreted last week which is that these reserve clause are in perpetuity because you can reserve and reserve and the next contract says you can reserve and the next contract says you can reserve and the next contract says you can reserve. So every year you have a contract with the guy no matter, as long as you want him. The only time a player can sign with another team is when you don't want him and you don't reserve him and then he's free. As John said, Peter Seitz looks at this the way we as law students, lawyers, look at this and say, wait a minute, that's not right. That's not a reserve clause. That's a clause in perpetuity. And he says, you know what? These guys are free because they had their one year, they were reserved, and now that's over. That's over. So this arbitrator named Peter Seitz is the 
person on this earth responsible for the advent of something that has changed sports called free agency. Andy Messersmith and Dave McNally are the first free agents in sports. Based on an arbitration and based on a little thought of clause in a CBA that said, you know what, if there's a dispute, we'll have an arbitrator hear it. And we'll pick the arbitrators together and he'll be independent or she'll be independent. That was huge. That is something the NFL doesn't have in, in 2017. That is something Major League Baseball had in 1970. So what we have is Peter Seitz deciding, you know what, this reserve clause stinks, this reserve clause should be for one year only, and I'm making these guys free agents. And they were free agents and they signed for big money. Major League Baseball did two things, they appealed and lost, and they fired Peter Seitz. Within 10 minutes of this decision, they fired Peter Seitz. So each side can fire an arbitrator as well. He goes down in their history as a true villain. Okay, so the way I paint it to you is that Kurt Flood pushed the ball towards the end line or hit a, a one into the warning track <laughs> and Andy Messmith and Dave McNally and Peter Seitz got it to the end zone or got it over the wall. This was the advent of free agency. It's not a court case, it's not Kurt Flood, but it is an arbitration <coughs> with credit to Marvin Miller for creating this little thought of clause about independent arbitration. So, what happens when a league loses a huge case like this is the players have leverage. Not great leverage, because they're still a young union and owners still have all the leverage, but it resulted in a new CBA. What happens when you have something like this, the owners say, we got a problem. We got to go to the players and get a new system so that all players don't become free agents after reserve years. So they created a whole new system in baseball, which we can talk about when, when we get into you know, collective bargaining agreements. This one has six years uh, before you become a free agent, uh, but three years, three, four, five, you're a uh, salary arbitration eligible, and these players are making huge money out of that. As you guys know, baseball contracts are massive, and it all started with this. Uh, CBA, new CBA negotiated by Marvin Miller, uh, and it was a winner. Now, one of the things that happened after the advent of free agency was players got rich right away. And players, that were, the average salary was like 100,000, it became 500,000, top contracts were a million dollars, became $5 million, and on and on. At some point, however, and this bring, ultimately brings us back to the name we can't shake, which is Kaepernick, at some point we had a situation where teams weren't signing players, weren't signing free agent. And this is known as the collusion era in baseball. Who's talking about that? Your name is? Lawrence. Lawrence, it's my dad's name. Right. Um, Who was the commissioner? Peter Ubroth. Yeah. Um, yeah, so there's 35 free agents, only four of them actually changed to 10. Um, and so they, you know, something sort of, they filed a grievance because it didn't seem right. And uh, that's when he, Ubroth was still telling them, uh, like owners, to give him a if they were thinking of contracts longer than right. years. And uh, Steinbrenner uh, pulled an offer after he got a call from the White Sox owner. 
Um, and then that ultimately went to arbitration and they found that in favor of the players. And then they flew the, the next year, uh, sort of the same thing was going on. It was another uh, 35 or so mm-hmm. free agents and all again, only four of them actually switched switch teams and that's when um, so they filed another grievance and they won that one too and then the year after that the owners sort of started to switch up how they were going to do right. it um, they made like a, a, a knowledge tank of like right. where they thought each player was worth and who right. inside information essentially between them filed a grievance and again uh, they lost the owners lost, they violated the CBA. Okay. So another background, another story about Marvin Miller that's not in the slides, but the union did another good thing. In this CBA that they didn't have any leverage, they didn't get much in terms of money, salaries, but they got the independent arbitration, they also got a collusion clause. And the reason they got the collusion clause, I've probably given too much credit to Marvin Miller, It's because owners were worried about player collusion. We had these joint holdouts back in the day. You remember a name, Sandy Koufax. There was a name, Don Drysdale. They were the best two pitchers on on the Dodgers. They held out together. So there was only, it was a perfect storm where the players could say, okay, we agree, no collusion. But it goes to your side too goes to your side too, you can't collude. And in so many words, collusion is when two or more teams or two or more players, whatever the case may be, conspire, collude, to in the case of the teams, not sign players or sign them for cheap contracts or sign them for one year deals or instead of two years or less than five years, whatever those things are. So we're back to the CBA and we're with the uh, going to an arbitration, both things that Marvin Miller created in the baseball CBA, they go in front of an arbitrator and he finds collusion in three separate years. Uh, So we have it in 85, 86, and 87. Uh, As Lawrence mentioned, you only have four players signed. These are good players. You guys are too young, but these names like Kirk Gibson, Tommy John, Phil Negro, nobody's signing these guys. Why? Because, as Lawrence mentioned, Peter Ubroth led a meeting of owners that they got the goods on, the players did, got the dirt on, where he told these owners, don't sign free agents, basically. And if you're going to sign them, I want to know about it. And if you're going to sign them for more than whatever, a year or two? Okay. I want to know about it. So it's clear collusion. Ever since then, leagues have been more careful, obviously. I can tell you, when I went to NFL meetings and they put up on the screen what everyone's spending on players, they were very clear to say, no, don't do it, you know, do or don't do anything. They were just showing you. Now, they would would show you a team that signed a lot of free agents and they would show you that their record stunk the next couple years, but they weren't telling you what to do or not to do. Again, all this can be construed different ways. Is that collusion? Can't be collusion, they're just giving you graphs. They're just giving you PowerPoints. Well, in the case of Ubroth, he told him. It was pretty obvious, right? He said, don't sign him. And went to arbitration, they proved it over three years. You see damages each year. The total came out to 280 million. $280 $280 million in damages going back to the players. At that time, there were 28 teams, so very clear, very easy math. $10 million per team in collusion damages. And then there was a whole formula about which players got what and how much and how long they were sitting out and why they didn't get offers. We don't need to concern ourselves with that, but they had to distribute that $280 million among these hundreds of players somehow, some way. 
big loss. I mean, 280 million in 19 whatever, 87, it's a lot of money. Collusion against the MLB owners for not signing free agents. So you see the free agent trajectory. Kurt Flood paving the way but didn't make it. Messmith McNally kicked it over the goal line. Then you get to free agency between 76 and 85. Huge, huge numbers. Me Peter Yerbroth tells the owners, we don't like it. It's not going well, stop it. Players find out about it, got smoking guns. Collusion case, 280 million, they lose. Okay, and in the background all this is kudos to Marvin Miller and Kurt Flood, leadership of the union, deciding we got to get this in there, which is independent arbitration and anti-collusion. Speaking of anti-collusion, <laughs> we will end the same way we started. Kaepernick has filed a lawsuit about collusion. Uh, who's talking about that? Khalil. And this is something going to a grievance in the same way the baseball was. Now we're not talking about free agency. As a whole, we're talking about one player who we all know for nine months has not been signed by an NFL team. Cleo. So Kaepernick filed a grievance lawsuit um, under the CBA for collusion uh, by the 32 owners of the NFL. Um, he's not going through the NFLPA on this one. He's actually going through a private attorney. Um, yeah, celebrity attorneys represented Michael Jackson and a lot of celebrities. Yeah. Um, uh, the following demands an arbitration hearing um, that the NFL owners colluded in uh, depriving him of employment rights based off of his uh, efforts of protest. Um, the NFLPA has responded saying that they support Kaepernick as they support all their players. Um, this grievance is going to be seen by uh, Stephen Verde. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, also looking into this case, um, it's also in the, in the next article it mentioned how much um, money that Kaepernick would have actually gotten if he played this whole year, um, which would have been 16.9 million. Um, and even calculating how much somebody, um, how much he would make if somebody actually signed him on his downside of his career, um, it's about 10 million dollars mm -hmm. uh, per year, which is what kind of similar to what um, Cutler got for his. Uh, Mm -hmm. uh, with Miami, and about three million, um, like Cole McCoy and a couple of other backups have gotten. So uh, if he gets signed now, um, that'll be around two thirds of his uh, year's contract. So he's still going to lose a lot of money through this. Um, but uh, the whole thing with this whole collusion um, case is, doesn't look like it's going to really rule his favor too well. Um, mainly because they're going to have to show some type of uh, evidence of this collusion that. Um, Obviously, these owners were emailing or having some type of conversation about Kaepernick and not wanting to sign him. Um, but uh, in the second article, also mentioned uh, some of the other cases in the MLB, um, mm -hmm. particularly the Barry Bonds case. Oh, yeah. And um, also another lawsuit that came from um, the MLB that actually won for $280 million. One we just um, talked they, about, yeah. yeah. Right. Okay, yeah, and as Khalil said, we need a smoking gun, right? We need to see evidence of two or more owners or one owner and the league. So it could be two owners or one or, one or more owners and the league conspiring, coordinated effort to keep them out of the league. You know, is there a text? Is there an email? Is there a tweet? Is there some DM tweet? about a uh, Facebook message not signing this guy? Is there a conversation? Is that going to be enough to trigger the collusion? Here is the language from the CBA that we lifted today. No club, its employees, agents shall enter into any agreement express or implied. The implied probably maybe gives Kaepernick a little bit of hope, implied. Uh, with the NFL or any other club, employees, agents to restrict or limit club decision making as to whether to negotiate or not negotiate with a player, or whether to offer or not offer a player contract. 
Okay, so standard uh, collu anti-collusion language. It's similar in baseball. Baseball is a little simpler than that, shorter. Um, basically saying you cannot coordinate effort to not offer or not negotiate with a player. Um, you guys know as well as anyone, got to have evidence. What's the evidence? Um, that's what we're going to, now, based on the statement of Garagos, the lawyer, he put out a statement about this case. He implied something's going on with Trump. So he's going to try to make this about the president, I think, co-opting uh, collusion. Um, you know, that he's had Robert Kraft on Air Force One, uh, and right after that, the day later, he told an audience in Kentucky, NFL owners don't want to pick up Kaepernick because they don't want to get a nasty tweet from Donald Trump. Okay, what we're looking at right there is probably evidence, that the proposed evidence that Kaepernick would put on, one of the pieces, I'm sure they'll put on all this stuff. Um, spoke to Jerry Jones. On the same day, he spoke to Jones, 25 owners convened at league headquarters. And then he wrote this, spoke to Jones, Jerry's a winner, <laughs> players will stand, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, no mention of Kaepernick, but I'm sure he'll talk about an implied actor there. Even today, Trump's trying to put out pressure, even though they're... NFL did not change the rule, as we know from the news today. Uh, and, of course, the president is pissed about this. <laughs> it will not force players to stand for the anthem. Total disrespect. Uh, okay. And again, we have to understand, 61,000 people, whatever time we put this together, had already liked that tweet. So, again, you see what the division this is causing. As Khalil said, I don't know if he's got a case. We don't know if there's a smoking gun. We don't know if there's evidence between teams or the league, but it does seem like he's somehow going to bring in the president's tweets, the president's conversations, the president having Trump, uh, Kraft on his airplane, talking to Jones, talking to these other guys. Be an interesting case to follow, <laughs> see what happens. And then if he's, if he's awarded, right, like you said, if he's awarded, what do we look at? We look at what Jay Cutler signed for at the beginning of the season coming out of the broadcast booth. We look at what guys signed for in the offseason. How does he get his money? It's only a third of the season left or whatever time he signs. So it's a complicated case. Uh, the bottom line is he's probably never going to play again. You know, you don't want to antagonize your future employers with a lawsuit, but he's probably realized that ship has sailed. You know, I think in one of those articles it said the last straw was the Tennessee Titans brought in like six quarterbacks when Mariota got hurt last week. I mean, if they're bringing in six quarterbacks to look at and he's not one of them. So that's where his... His status lies, the guy who started all this <laughs> has now brought a collusion lawsuit, which dovetails right into our conversation about baseball collusion. My opinion, it would be a shock if he won to somehow use Trump's tweets and conversations as collusion of NFL owners, I think is a really stretch. But like we said, we don't know if there's a smoking gun out there. 